Hello. <laughs> Good evening. How are you? This is Iko Kusisi from the African Press Club live in Barcelona. I have a wonderful guest here with me, Jess Craig. Hi, Jess. Hi. <laughs> so Jess is a book agent and um, I met Jess sometime last year when I was trying to organize an event for the African Press Club. We have a mutual friend and she introduced us and Jess introduced me to some books. I am Nigerian as you all know or as you may know and Jess was promoting two books from a Nigerian author, Chigozie Obioma. Both of his books, um, An Orchestra of Minorities and The Fisherman, uh, both of the books had been shortlisted for the Booker Prize. That's a very prestigious prize. And around that time, they were waiting to see whether um, he will win the prize. Eventually, he did not. <laughs> but the books have been hugely successful. So I'm going to ask Jess, um, when you heard that the book uh, didn't win the prize, it was the Orchestra of Minorities. Um, how did you feel? Were you heartbroken? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, I think um, it's always such an honor just to make it to the shortlist for that prize because it is um, so competitive and um, and especially this uh, past year, it's 2019, um, there were, I mean, some big name authors on the short list as well, uh, like Margaret Atwood and Salman Rushdie and uh, Elif Shafak. Um, so you always need to just feel so happy and, and proud um, to get that far. But, um, I think this time was quite heartbreaking because, um, I mean, the first time with his debut, The Fisherman, yeah. I mean, especially in that situation, when you're, it's your first novel that's on the short list, you really just have to be so glad to be in the room. Um, but, uh, but yeah, to have the, the second novel, it felt like had even stronger chances um, of maybe winning and yeah and then there was this like strange thing that the booker judges actually did that took everybody by surprise and was quite controversial where they chose two winners um, instead of just one um, one of those uh, Bernadine Aristo is a uh, British Nigerian um, great writer who uh, is now the first uh, black woman to ever win the Booker Prize. Wow. Um, so that was I mean, really exciting and important um, and something that we all should celebrate. Um, but it definitely felt very strange, especially on the night to have that <laughs> announcement that it was like double winners and um, they, they judges broke the rules to uh, make that choice um, and but it's it looks like it's a good time to be a woman <laughs> women are winning so many things um, in, in every sector do you think that there was a, a female consideration do you think mm -hmm. the men looks like they're losing out what are your thoughts on oh that oh god I don't know if I can <laughs> really talk about that um I, I think there was, I mean, I think, I think both books that won, especially Girl, Woman, Other, certainly, I mean, in the books themselves are worthy uh, yes. of winning. Um, but it did feel particularly this year in the uh, Booker, that there were kind of external factors 
influencing the, the decision of the judge, mm -hmm. the judges, um, and, and the judges said so themselves. I mean, there were uh, pieces written afterwards um, that indicated that. So, um, but I have to. Um, it's been such a, yeah, a very wonderful journey uh, with Chigotsia. Um, and he's still such a young writer. He's actually current, he's the only writer in the whole history of the Booker Prize, um, or certainly the youngest writer in the whole history of the Booker Prize to have both his first and second novels uh, shortlisted. Um, He's in, his, he's in his 30s, right? Yeah. Early 30s, I think. Or, uh, third, he was born in 1986, so... That... You're asking some more. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, so so mathematics is cool. about 35. <laughs> <laughs> so these are some of Jess's books, um, the books she has been promoting. Bonner Boy. This, is this one is not actually, B. I mean, it's B. Bandele is um, one of my authors, mm. a great Nigerian writer and also a filmmaker. Um, and this is the last novel that he had published, which was over 10 years ago. It was mm -hmm. in 2007. Um, and then he went off into filmmaking and he made, yes. he was the um, screenwriter and director for Half of the Yellow Sun. Oh, excellent. Um, mm. But it's now that he's uh, writing a new novel and really intending to return to fiction writing. Mm. So I'm really excited. So um, there's another book here, mm -hmm. See You in the Cosmos by Jack Chan. This book, this table is full of books, so mm. I'm just going to show you quickly then. The fish, then the fish swallowed him. This, this is, is by amazing. Amir Aryan. Yeah. An amazing Iranian novel. Okay. That was just published in March. Oh, this is very new then. Yeah, this is the newest one. Then there's Zanib Mian. So these are book suggestions for you if mm -hmm. you're into reading. These Planet ones are for Oman. children. Oh, so, oh, oh okay. Um, okay. So middle grade kids. So if you're kids. watching and you have kids, <laughs> this is one for your kids. And then this is Chigozio's Obiomo's yeah, book. This is the French edition okay. of uh, An Orchestra of Minorities. Okay. And I, I love the cover. I think it's one of the most beautiful. And this is the English version? The paperback. Yeah, paperback. And can show. this is the British hardcover. Mm. So these two are the British. Yeah, okay. And this is the American uh, hardcover. And this is the Nigerian one. So that's okay. the one that's published in Nigeria by Parisea. And, and then I like this. The book <laughs> was made into a play by Gwalanho um, Obisiason was made into a play and just has told me that it was a big hit <laughs> in in London, in the UK generally and I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. So tell me Jess. Um, I just want to show one more. This is the German okay. edition oh. of an orchestra of minorities and I'm showing this because just last week it was announced that uh, Chigotsi is one of the winners of this year's um, International Literature Prize, which yes. is like the Booker Prize for Germany. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and then this is Chigozie's other book, The Fisherman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. That's so, the Nigerian one. Wow. That. So this is a table of books. So mm -hmm. tell me about being a book agent. What's the process for people who are interested? You want to be a book agent? I'm sure you're buried in books all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you just see all the boxes of them. <laughs> what is the process? What do you really do? <laughs> um, many different things, actually. It's, um, I mean, it's a very demanding and challenging job because there's so many different things that you need to do, especially when you're like me as an independent agent founded my own agency um, uh, what in 2016 so almost four years ago and so if 
if you're like me, you really need to do kind of everything um, for the writers. And it's, um, I mean, the primary role of an agent is to um, to convince publishers to publish, to invest in your writers and to publish their works. Um, but that involves uh, like pitching and promoting and, and pushing uh, each work to the appropriate publishers, um, sometimes not only in one country, but like in several different countries. Um, and it involves um, negotiating, like if you are so fortunate to get an offer or more than one offer from a publisher, then that involves a lot of negotiations um, and uh, processing contracts and then and making sure the writer gets paid. Um, so those are sort of the primary roles, but I think now increasingly it seems that agents I mean, there's a lot more gaps to always be filling in um, as a real just champion of uh, the writer and uh, advocate for the writer. There's a lot, I think, especially with social media, so much uh, of a kind of publicity role that an agent, I mean, not all agents do as much as others, but I think... Um, newer, younger agents um, uh, do a lot of kind of things that in the past were taken care of entirely by like a publicist. Yes. And what else? Uh, you read a huge amount. I mean, I read uh, drafts like pretty early on from my writers and that can involve well, more and more agents need to um, be able to be almost like early editors for their writers. Um, and, and that can involve reading just one manuscript multiple times. Yes. Um, and yeah, and then, yeah, those are kind of the general things. <laughs> Sounds, sounds uh, like a laborious yeah. job. There's also, you, I mean, to really have, um, you need to constantly be kind of keeping up and expanding your own network as an yeah. agent and keeping track of like, who are the editors that you want to be uh, submitting to that would be the best for each particular kind of work by each writer. Um, what are the, I mean, especially these days since the pandemic and now with all the social mm -hmm. and, like racial yes. justice yeah. to, uh, and how that these things are impacting the publishing industry and um, it's I think essential for agents uh, to be closely following um, all these things. So talking about convincing publishers, um, I, I was. Um, looking at your Instagram page recently mm -hmm. and I saw that you were specifically promoting your black and brown writers mm. and I would like to know is it more difficult to get publishers for the black and brown writers African people people of African descent people from other places other than Western countries how difficult is it well um, I think until recently, like until maybe a few years ago, probably until 2016, because that was like, I mean, the year that became a kind of wake up call to um, the publishing industry, especially in the US and UK, um, about the lack of diversity um, in, in terms of authors, in terms of people who work within the publishing industry. And so that has, I think, created new opportunities or new openings um, for uh, minority writers or 
the black and brown writers. Um, but, and now, I mean, it's exciting to see, like, if you look at the New York Times bestseller list from last week, suddenly, like, both sides, like, fiction and nonfiction are full of books um, by black writers or book and books that are about race in some way. Um, so maybe, I mean, hopefully publishers will start to see that these kinds of books increasingly are books that actually will sell, that like there'll be a kind of uh, a more of a profit incentive, um, not just like a, a sense of, I don't know, obligation so, that the publishers have. But it is, I mean, um, it's it's not easy in any way. I mean, to be a new writer in general, it's very difficult to break through. Um, there's so much, so many demands on everyone's attention now, and um, the uh, publishing is now so focused on. I mean, it's. Basically, it's a, a small number of big name, like brand name authors that sell, like their books sell the most. Um, and especially now that like so many, I mean, in the context of the pandemic, and I think this is what's going to happen more and more going forward is publishers have to rely more on online sales. Yes. And it's generally like the best, chances of getting um, excitement around a new writer tends to come from like booksellers in their shops like hand selling certain books or like interacting with people like face to face about the new writers that they're excited about whereas in online sales I think it tends to favor even more the um, kind of the big brand name yes. writers. So when you when when you try to um, look for a publisher, have you found that among writers outside of Western countries, the rejections do they come from the type of stories, or the quality of the writing, or what 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 are the main reasons why this this potential writers' books are rejected? Well. Um yeah it's i mean it's always so subjective reading and like which books people like um so and and that's i mean with literary fiction which is um not the only kind of book that i represent but i guess i'm most known as a champion of, of new voices in literary fiction um and that is so subjective so it doesn't I mean, I know it's always kind of heartbreaking when there's a, I mean, every book that I choose, or a writer that I choose to represent, it's because I absolutely love their voice, their writing, and I see potential for the book. And then when you have, I mean, especially when it comes up again and again, editors saying no, and so that sense of like, vision is not being shared, it, it hurts. <laughs> um, but... I am learning, I mean, I think with black and brown writers, I think they're, I'm sure, and this is starting to be a kind of conversation that's happening kind of in the public arena now or like on Twitter and stuff about these kind of biases, racial biases that most editors probably do have. Um, since most editors are, are white. I mean, I'm not, um, obviously I'm white, but I, I guess I've always had a very sort of open mind about things that I read and I've always been very kind of curious and embracing of uh, lots of different like books, especially from different cultures and writers of different races. Um, but 
I don't know, I suppose if you've grown up kind of reading more of like one kind of book over and over, or books by only white writers, or your favorite authors are all white writers, then there might be things that sort of subconsciously are influencing your, I mean, when you hear from editors, I mean, for example, these uh, black uh, and brown women writers that I've been kind of giving extra um, attention to uh, over this past week, um, the it's felt like a long. I mean, especially with um, with one of them, the uh, it's been a very long and like tenacious fight, like of almost a year now, and it doesn't make sense to me really in a kind of logical way the the uh the reactions uh from from editors um especially when they say they can't i don't know connect with the characters mm -hmm. or um so i mean i hope that these kinds of things will start to change but um it's a very, um, there's, I think it's going to be a really kind of messy, like complicated time between yeah. like now and getting to a place where uh, there's equality in, in the publishing industry. Um, so when I was talking to you recently um, during the lockdown, you told me that you had read 11 books. I mean, <laughs> I know it's your job but it sounded a lot to me. Within a space of, I think, two months, you have read 11 books. And I immediately thought there are so many people who would like to be readers, mm -hmm. who would like to incorporate reading in their mm -hmm. life, but their work schedules are very busy. So I thought, mm -hmm. do you have a technique to share with us on how <laughs> we can become readers, make it a habit, yeah. you know, <laughs> include that in our lives? Um, that's a nice thing to think about. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I do see it as part of my job to be reading constantly and, and those 11 books were all books by writers that are not my own writers. So, um, and I, uh, I think it's important for me to like, to keep kind of sharpening my own taste and my own like vision and, and seeing, um, what other writers are writing that I that I love, um, but the locked the books that I read during lockdown were specifically meant to to be pleasure reading because that's the hardest thing of like working in like where you have to read for a living. Um, there have been times in my career, I mean, especially before I started my own agency, like over the years that I was working for like big other agencies. Um, where I had no time to read for pleasure um, and I really was starting to lose that fundamental sense of escaping into a, a good book um, but I think it is something sadly that has become difficult for a lot more people now to um, have the concentration and the time um, that's not full of distractions to really escape into a book. Um, but I think lockdown, having this, yeah, sort of globally imposed time where many of us um, had to be staying home, um, had all these books <laughs> um, on our shelves that we hadn't had time to read, um, it was an ideal time to be uh, just yeah, reading one book after another. Um, but, but at the same time, I mean, I did keep reading articles about like people, like I think because of the sense of anxiety out there, um, it is like a lot of people, I think actually struggled even during this lockdown period to have the concentration to read. Um, I mean, I would just recommend that 
I don't know. I mean, I think people who love books, like, we always return to reading, especially in times of, like, stress or upheaval or uncertainty. Um, uh, the people who, I mean, if you aren't accustomed to reading books frequently or, and it's, if you feel like it's something you would like to do, then I think you should just, well, you should start uh, first discovering which kinds of books you like to read. Um, maybe start with things that are kind of lighter or like um, shorter um, than like <laughs> than an orchestra of minorities. <laughs> maybe start with the fishermen actually. <laughs> um, and uh, or start with uh, a book for kids. Like, I mean, this is actually, it's a a book for young, uh, for middle grade readers, but it's a book that adults really love as well. Um, and so, and just, yeah, try to find it, yeah. like, <laughs> um, try to find a time of day, like maybe it's like, for just an hour, like first thing in the morning, instead of like going to your phone and checking the news right away, spend like, I don't know, 30 minutes or an hour reading a book. Or a lot of people like to read before bed, so it can become, I mean, that tends to be when I do most of my pleasure reading is um, in the evening, because if I've been looking at a screen all day, as I usually am, then I, I want to, um, and all the manuscripts that I read, I read on uh, my tablet, so even those are, I read electronically, so by the end of the day, I really just like to have a real paper <laughs> book. Um, okay, that's, that's a good one, so you have tips <laughs> right here, <laughs> use it. So I want to take you back to your Instagram where you have been promoting your black and mm. brown right, black black and brown writers. Some of the names that I saw there were Lola Akinmade, who wrote Afro Sweet. <laughs> Afro Sweet. You uh, would love this book, I think. Uh, okay. <laughs> Elizabeth Chakrabarti, then Diana. Have these books been published yet? Or? No. So that's why. I mean, usually on my on my social media, especially the Instagram, um, until now, I have only, I really only just put, like, uh, posts about published books, or sometimes news, like if an article, if it, one of my authors is interviewed in a magazine, or um, if there's, uh, if they write an essay that's published in, ex in an exciting place, then I'll do a post about that, but this was the first time that I decided to really sort of present um, uh, works by, that are currently on submission actually to publishers. Um, so, and as I said, the uh, novel by Lola, Akinmare, Akrostrom, Afro Swede, um, has been on submission for almost a year and, um, but it's very, I mean, it's it's a slightly more commercial book than most of what I do, but it it's, has that combination that can be really wonderful of sort of both literary and commercial. Um, and I think we see more and more books like by um, black women kind of doing very well in that uh, arena. Um, like Girl, Woman, Other, and Queenie, and Such a Fun Age. These are all bestsellers. Um, and I think Afro Swede really, it's something very different from those books because it's set, uh, most, some of it is in, is in the US, but most of it is in Stockholm, Sweden, um, which is where the author lives, but she's, uh, she's Nigerian American. She lived for a long time, for 16 years in, in the US. Um, and it's about three different black women who have completely different journeys, um, but they all sort of connect um, in Stockholm, Sweden, for different reasons. Um, although there is um, a, 
a white male character. Um, he's a Swedish uh, uh, like advertising uh, company uh, billionaire, probably. He owns a big, like one of the, a major uh, advertising company, and so he plays a different role in well in two of the three women's lives, and then the third woman is um, a Somali refugee who is trying to escape uh, her uh, painful past and start a new life in, in uh, Sweden and she ends up getting a job as like the cleaner in the office um, that this guy is the boss of. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on in the book but yeah. it has um, like written by a diaspora, yeah, you know, that kind of, you know, like Americana, it, it, which was also written yeah, by a exactly. diaspora Nigerian. That's a good comparison. And you know, you seem so passionate yeah, yeah. when when you talk about <laughs> your books, <laughs> you know, yeah. and the people that you represent. What's special about Elizabeth Chakrabarti? She's another person that you're representing. Um, I should just say one more thing about Afro Suite is just this week, actually, just the other day, we did get a first offer. From a great U.S. publisher, so watch this space. Okay. There, there will be like good news coming mm -hmm. soon. Um, Elizabeth Chakrabarty. So, where's uh, she from? She's uh, British Indian, and um, she has a bit of a Barcelona connection. Actually, she um, spent time in Barcelona at a kind of writers' retreat. Um, and I didn't meet her during that time, but it was kind of through the connection that I later made with that, um, the GWAR um, Center in Gracia that kind of led us together. Um, but she lives in London, and so her book actually, out of these three, um, is the only one that there is a deal for. So this is my first new deal of the year. Okay. Um, oh, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> back down, you're still locking down deals? Well, actually okay. the deal happened in January, okay. but um, there are some yeah, lockdown deals that will be happening as well. Um, so her book is called Lessons in Love and Other Crimes. And I just think this book is going to be so such a must read when it's published next year. Um, it's being published by a fairly new um, and independent publisher uh, in the UK called Indigo Press, but they're doing some really beautiful books, um, including by some African writers. Um, and there's a kind of emphasis on books by women um, that are literary, but um, although there's also, they do some interesting nonfiction as well. Um, and this book actually is a, I love books that sort of cross genre mm -hmm. and that are hybrid kind of books that, um, I mean, this one could, there are elements of uh, nonfiction or also of um, crime fiction. And it's a way of writing about hate crime that I really don't think has ever been done before and approaches the subject in such a in, uh, illuminating, heartbreaking, also very personal way, because it's based on a, a kind of a shocking experience that the author um, had in her own life um, in, in England. So. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited that will be published Okay, next we year. have to wrap up quickly. <laughs> so, but uh, the other book was by Diana. Diana and Anna, Anna Yakuo. Anna Anna Yakuo? Uh -huh. Where is she from? And tell us quickly. Yeah, um, she's uh, British Nigerian. Um, oh, Nigerians are everywhere. <laughs> Look, Nigerians, <laughs> give us a break. <laughs> she grew up in Lagos, actually. Okay. Um, or she was born in Lagos and she uh, lived in Lagos until she was a teenager. Her father um, was a Nigerian doctor, her mother Irish, white. Um, and then she moved to Manchester, England as a kind of mid-teenager and that's where she continues to live now as an adult. Um, and the 
the novel that she's written is, I guess it sort of is a cross between being a young adult novel or an adult novel. It's a coming of age novel. Um, and I, and written in a kind of literary uh, first person voice of the girl um, from early childhood. It starts when she's about four years old and it continues until she's 14. And it is autobiographical. I mean, it's she's mixed race and has this real struggle to, um, it's like she always feels, the novel is called My Life as a Chameleon, and it's like she always feels either too visible or invisible yes. in every situation. Um, and so it is a really interesting way of, of kind of writing about uh, a child's uh, coming to terms with race. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also a very powerful theme of mental illness in it because the character of, of uh, Lily's father is a schizophrenic. He's a, like a high functioning uh, schizophrenic. And when that, he has a breakdown um, when she's seven years old and she witnesses her father physically attacking her mother and it completely changes her whole perception uh, of both of her parents and like her whole family life but it, it literally makes her terrified from then on of her father when she's sort of seeing what his madness um, is capable of and so it's but then uh, it's also really moving and um, yeah it feels like wow. a kind of classic coming of age novel that I wish I could have read when I was uh, a teenager. <laughs> Thank you so much. I like the title, um, The Life of a Chameleon? Is my it? Life as my, a Chameleon. My Life as a Chameleon. It sounds very in interesting mm -hmm. and looks like something you would want to read. I'm going to go through um, Jesse's books again so you can <laughs> see some recommendations. Um, this is if you like to read a play. <laughs> a play. Um, you know, in case you're still in lockdown, I mean, most people have resumed work but um at least you can still if you want to start your reading life <laughs> start you, with these you, 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 you can start from here mm -hmm. uh, from jesse's recommendations mm -hmm. and books recommendations and books yeah, and then this one these are the english ones yeah well just thank you so much thank you um really i think it's been a, a wonderful time um jess is an agent so if you are someone who wants to write a book already <laughs> in the process of writing a book you know who to look for <laughs> your instagram handle is what uh, it's Craig Literary, at Craig Literary. At Craig Literary. You can find Jess over there, so please ambush her. <laughs> no, no, please don't. <laughs> I mean, you know, I should well, say. I, send her something. Yeah. Uh, I, I am way behind in reading my new it, submissions, it, so it's going to be anyway. very slow through the so summer. So finally, 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 what, what about advice do you have for anybody who is yeah. into books, loves books, you know, just revels in it. Final advice, mm. some words, parting words. Maybe that I think it, since we already talked about reading and how to maybe get into the pleasure of reading, um, I think I'll just give some advice for anybody who thinks they're a writer or wants to be a writer. <laughs> um, well, I think actually they're, they're connected because you have to be a passionate reader in order to be a writer. Right. Um, and so if you haven't, if you think you just want to write and you haven't actually read many books in your life or uh, kind of felt the, the passion of reading, then I would actually suggest you just start reading books. Um, but then um, I think it's also important to really take the time to practice your craft of writing, like before you start sending your work to agents um, or to editors. Um, to I mean, 
have it be a daily thing that you do, like even if it's just, I don't know, one page, one paragraph a day and a clear, have a clear kind of uh, sense, like an idea of the book that you want to write. And, um, and I think it's becoming increasingly essential, um, but it's always been, I think, essential that like writers are also your own editor, like in the first instance. I think a lot of writers, or young writers, don't, uh, I mean, unless you do go to a writing workshop or like an MF or an MFA program, you don't necessarily learn how to edit your own work mm -hmm. or how to kind of be your first critic. Um, but fortunately, there are a lot more, I think, places now that you can uh, hone those kinds of skills, like by finding, I mean, online writing workshop. You don't have to, I don't know, go to like one of the like physical like MFA programs yeah. to learn this stuff, but you can find a lot of articles about it. You can find sort of groups, writing groups online. Um, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for listening, for watching. Um, this is Ikoku CC again from the African Press Club and we have been talking to Jess Craig, um, a book agent living in Barcelona. Um, she's leaving Barcelona soon, so I thought to myself, I must talk to yeah, her. I hope timing. that you've been able to learn one or two things. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our channel at Ikoku CC and please check out Jess on her Instagram at uh, Craig Literary. And uh, thank you very much. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, and I'll see you soon. <laughs> Take care now. Bye. 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 <laughs>